Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and it's my pleasure to host Signe Wilkinson this evening. You may know Signe from her 35-year career at such newspapers as the Daily News or the Philadelphia Inquirer, or from her introductions of authors at the library, including Nobel Prize winner and former NIH head Harold Varmus. She also introduced Jermaine Greer, Jules Pfeiffer and Ed Sorrell, Ross Douthat and Larry Flint. FYI, there was a comma between Douthat and Flint. And feel free to ask her about that last one during the Q&A. A couple of her colleagues from past and present Philadelphia have kindly passed along some words by way of introduction. Here is a note from Dave Barry. One of my finest accomplishments in the field of journalism was launching the career of Signe Wilkinson when I was an editor of the Daily Local News, a small newspaper in Westchester, PA. To be honest, I didn't hire her as a cartoonist. I didn't even know she was a cartoonist. I hired her as a stringer to cover the meetings of municipal bodies such as the West Goshen Township Board of Supervisors. The hours were long and the pay was terrible, but on the other side of the ledger, the meetings were unbelievably boring. I'm pretty sure that at some point, Signe's feeling was, this sucks, I'm going to be a cartoonist. And thus, a star was born. And here's a short video from Signe's friend and editor, Sandra Shea. My name is Sandy Shea. I'm the managing editor of Opinion for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I've been a colleague of Signe Wilkinson's for over 20 years and her editor for at least 10 years. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce her tonight, though unfortunately I'm doing this remotely and beaming this separately since I have to miss the event due to a previous commitment. So I'm sure that half of you are here tonight because you all have the same burning question. How do I get a job drawing cartoons for a newspaper? I imagine you think it's really fun sitting around and drawing stick figures and thought balloons all day, never having to leave your house or interview anyone or sweating over finding just the right words to convey an idea and then having to cut half of those words because there's not enough space in the paper. It all seems pretty easy, doesn't it? Well, that's not true. And it's certainly not true in Signe's case. One of the things that has made Signe's cartoons so resonant and impactful for the city and the region for the past 35 years is that she does in fact work really hard. She hits the streets frequently. She talks to people. She travels all over the city. And she worries about words as much as she worries about the images. Although I will tell you, she can't spell to save her life. You know, every newspaper used to have a staff editorial cartoonist. And now cartoonists are an endangered species. Signe is among the small handful left. And we've been lucky to hold on to her for so long. Alas, that is about to change, and you are the first to hear this publicly, that at the end of the year, she will be retiring from the Inquirer for some well-earned leisure and family time. She still will be doing her national cartoons for her syndicate, so she won't be disappearing completely from the Inquirer, but those wonderful local cartoons about Philadelphia and the region um, are um, going to be not with us for uh, after the end of the year. As her friend, of course, I'm thrilled for her, but as her editor, I'm very sad. Still, I know she won't disappear. She's not gonna end the passion that she has for this city. She's not gonna stop getting outraged at injustices and stupidity or stop laughing at the absurdities that we all see around us. She will continue to get out on the streets and talk to people as well as champion young artists in the city and around the country. So tonight you're gonna to be getting a really great perspective as well as a retrospective on her 35 years of cartooning. So without further delay, please welcome Signe Wilkinson. Um, thank you all for uh, zooming in. It's, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody's had like a few too many Zoom calls that is. So uh, we'll try to make this uh, go quickly for you. 
Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be part of the author series. I'm usually introducing people and not um, doing the main event. So this is kind of cool. Uh, I also want to thank the library's concerned black workers who are supporting this series so that it continu can continue to give a venue for diverse audiences to hear the diverse voices of black and brown writers as well as the occasional old pale woman cartoonist. We're into diversity here. So uh, good luck to the workers and to the library in your work towards equity and equality and inclusion. When I am drawing my cartoons, I often listen to uh, Andy Kayan's real authors, reading their books and sharing their wisdom. Regrettably, if the author is really, really good, I have to turn them off because I sometimes start writing what they're saying into my cartoon bubbles. It's a compliment to them, not to me. Uh, I will be mostly just sharing slides, um, but I did promise Andy I'd say a few words uh, about how I began my illustrious career, and they will be a very few words because it boils down to I had really, really good luck. I, um, I pieced together a number of jobs after graduating from college with the essential BA in English and no discernible skills. One of those jobs was uh, at the now defunct Today's Post, which was a daily newspaper in King of Prussia, where they sent me off to do school board meetings and other, um, other municipal um, organizations, just as Dave Barry um, said. I moved over to the Daily News um, where D Dave was not the Dave Barry. He was just um, a recent Haverford College grad working with Hannah Gardner, who was a recent Swarthmore College grad. Um, and um, it was shoes optional in that newsroom and really a lot of fun. But um, he's right, I went out to do a, town, a lot of township supervisor meetings where um, I heard many, many trained traffic engineers give presentations saying why the development that was under consideration of 50 new townhouses would add absolutely no traffic to the road it was attached to. Um, so those, <laughs> those uh, traffic engineers have stuck in my brain ever since. The, um, I got paid $10 a story um, plus mileage. Um, and mileage is where we all did our creative writing. You just can't imagine how many miles it is between Westchester and Kennett Square, for example, got longer as uh, the rent came due. And at any rate, the, I really enjoyed those uh, evenings. They were the cornerstones of American democracy, people coming out, volunteering their time to try to um, keep the traffic engineers under control. Uh, but they did tend to be boring. And so I would start drawing on the uh, edges of my notes, just like I did in high school and college on, um, on the edge of my schoolwork. And those uh, drawings, the Daily News started um, excerpting and using here and there, especially on Fridays, they had a, a, a little potpourri of um, tidbits of, about the news and my drawings just kept getting bigger and finally they turned into actual editorial cartoons and um, I realized they combined my interest in art and my interest in politics and my lack of interest in spelling so it was perfect for me. 
um, I had no formal background in, in art um, since middle school with Kathy Brown, who was a fantastic art teacher, but it was middle school. So um, I left downtown Chester County and moved into the city and started enrolling in every art school in town, eventually ending up at the Academy of Fine Arts. Um, and I supported myself at the Academy of Natural Sciences. So I was quite the academician. And um, my, my job at the Academy was fantastic. I did artwork and layout work for them. Um, but I also got to meet and uh, learn from the scientists there who were just fantastically uh, great at their fields and also really strange and wonderful people. Uh, I still know and see some of them, uh, including Bob Peck, who is still there. Uh, he's going to be in one of the dioramas someday, that is my guess. But at any rate, um, it, at the Academy, I, oh, by the way, I had a stuffed emu in my office. Not everyone has one of those. And it, but I, I could, when I was doing the layout of Frontiers magazine, I could do, I could put illustrations in who, you know, I was, they were paying me anyway. So I could slowly get um, clippings that uh, showed, showed my work. And the um, other thing that happened was at the Academy of Fine Arts, um, where I was mostly in the printing department, but I took a painting course once and uh, sitting next to me painting a tuba was a Kitty Caparella, who was at the time a reporter at the Daily News and a real character in the city of Philadelphia. Um, she was in partial, partly for art therapy because some of the stories she had to cover were really, really rough. I mean, she did a lot of the mob stories. She One day she came in and she had just covered someone who had pushed a child out of, uh, of a window uh, onto the street. Um, so um, she, she was uh, living a quite different life than I was. Um, she was also friends with another cartoonist, and she took me one evening to meet Tony Auth at a, uh, an art gallery in Old City, the Rosenfeld Gallery, which has since closed. But Tony was having a show there, and I, I got a chance to meet him. Um, uh, and he opened some doors at the Inquirer where I was able to uh, do little op-ed drawings for the Inquirer's um, opposite editorial page. And I also, through another um, circuitous route, um, started uh, doing part-time work at what was then Today Magazine at the Inquirer, their Sunday magazine. Um, I did, again, illustrations, and it was so long ago that uh, when I had to lay out the um, crossword puzzle, I had to actually cut it out and put it, uh, put it wax on the back, put it on, the, uh, on a larger board and cut out all those little um, clues um, and arrange them. <laughs> and one day, I, um, I did that and you have to, then I had to Xerox it so I'd have a record of it and I pulled it out and I came back a half hour later and looked at the Xerox machine and there were a whole bunch of little clues still on the Xerox machine. There's one thing you should know about newspapers. People really care about what's on the front page. They do, then they say they do, but they really, really, really care about the crossword puzzles and you do not want to screw that up. So um, that was an important lesson in journalism for me to learn. Um, at any rate, I started doing more cartoons, got a portfolio together, and after trying several places, landed a job in San Jose, California, which was like going from Jupiter to Mars. I mean, it was so different from Philadelphia. It was right at this, this was in the early 1980s, 82. 
uh, Apple Computer was just getting started nearby, Hewlett Packard was there, all these um, uh, new young companies and new young people came flooding in, including a lot of refugees from Philadelphia, which at the time was old and stayed and um, uh, not much happening. Uh, so the smartest kids in Philadelphia uh, up and left and ended up in Silicon Valley and are probably now multi-billionaires. Um, so it was great for me to be there then to see it and to see how people can run a city differently than uh, Philadelphia. They didn't have a, they had a weak mayor system. So that was totally new and different. And uh, an, uh, one of my colleagues at the paper um, left before me, and that was Steve Lopez, who went from the San Jose Mercury to um, the Inquirer and became a fantastic uh, columnist in the uh, late 80s and early 90s before he decamped for Los Angeles. Um, so that too was a, a, a terrific place to work. And um, then uh, the siren song of Philadelphia called and I was able to uh, to get the job at the Daily News in 1985. Um, and we almost stayed, but we had fam both my husband and I had family back here and we had a new daughter. And so that became an important um, consideration. And so we came back and um, well, I've been here ever since. So now I'm going to just show a, a few cartoons of the, I mean, I, literally over 10,000 cartoons I've drawn um, since being here. Um, and it took a long time to go through them. It, oh my God, wait till you see them. I, I was so bad. My, my drawing was still really primitive. So one of the things you might see is that people can get better from very lowly beginnings, uh, if you uh, trust in them and, and give them uh, patience and support. Um, here we go, uh, 35 years of, uh, of cartoons, most of them about Philadelphia. Um, um, here we are at the library. Uh, I'm going to start here because you're the you're the people who brung me to this uh, party, and um, this is uh, this was in the early or you know in the mid 1980s, early 80s, that um, and we must forcefully tell the city, please, please, pretty please, could you maybe just cut us 10 percent instead of 12 percent? Uh, this was the library board meeting. Uh, the library was in really rough shape then. Um, then uh, I've done many over the years, but this is in 08 with the banks, the cars, the cities all falling uh, during the financial crisis and the library saying, do you have a book about the impact of the economic crisis? And of course that was followed uh, by uh, Michael Nutter becoming mayor, and he's uh, manning the 311 call center. Help! Someone's trying to close our library. <laughs> and as you recall, that someone was Michael Nutter. Um, and everyone at the library and all your supporters rose up. Um, and I did several cartoons about it as well. Um, and the most of the cuts were, or, or closures that were um, rescinded or, or modified substantially. But that was a very rough time for the good old library. Um, so now we'll get back to the regular city. This was my first cartoon the day that I got, um, the, the day I started. Uh, she's saying, could any of you gentlemen give me the time? And it's uh, Wilson Good, 1130. Uh, Police Chief Sambor, 1300 hours. Fire, 1215. 
and uh, his managing director, Brooks Nine Sharp. And that was uh, about the, the way the city had uh, was disorganized in many, many things, including its response to MOVE, which had happened um, in May, this would be in October, uh, it, uh, May 13th, of course, 1985 was the move bombing. Um, I was still in San Jose at the time. And um, I, I was in the, it, at, at my drawing board and a reporter came over in the morning and said, you know, there's a big fire in Philadelphia. And I sort of shrugged and said, there always is a big fire in Philadelphia. Um, but he came back like five hours later and said, no, I mean, there's a really big fire in Philadelphia and it's still going. And that's when I went and looked at the television and saw um, what we all know to have been the move catastrophe. This is how it uh, was supposedly closed. There was a grand jury report and this closes the book on move. And uh, it essentially closed the book on the stories of the um, people who had died in the house. Um, and we're still living with the um, aftermath of MOVE this year as well. This one is in totally different. This is, uh, uh, I include just for the story that went with it. It was how I um, realized that being a woman is, um, a woman cartoonist is not the normal uh, thing a reader would expect. This was when um, the Roofers Union had, it was under uh, federal indictments were out for I think 17 of their members. And um, in another, incident, they had gone over to New Jersey and beaten up some um, colleagues, I guess. Um, and so that was a big, big story at the time. Um, and as you'll remember, there, there was the um, commercial for the garment workers, look for the union label. When you are buying your dresses and blou or blouses and dress, something like that. At any rate, um, so I used that for uh, the, the caption, but <laughs> what the reason I include it uh, was not just a reminder of um, uh, Philadelphia's culture at the time, uh, but um, I was in the company cafeteria. We still had a cafeteria at that point. And I was walking by some tables and looked down and some of the printers, the printers were still in our building on North Broad Street. I looked over the shoulder and I could see that the printer was on the page with my cartoon. And he was saying, did you see this? This guy's got balls, referring to me. I went, oh yes, <laughs> I've made it. Which um, I know sounds incredibly uh, pathetic and sexist, but I wanted to be, um, I didn't want to be seen as a woman cartoonist. I just wanted to be seen as a cartoonist. Um, and the name Signe is ambiguous enough that a lot of my hate mail began, dear Mr. Wilkinson. So I, I felt like, um, people could react to the cartoons without putting a lens in front of them like, oh, this is typical of what a woman would say um, because, um, well, that's what the, uh, it, people who do know that I'm a woman, woman that, that, that does color some of the, some of the comments that I, that I get. So at any rate, that's just a side story. Um, this is back to city politics, and uh, it's uh, Wilson Good uh, playing chess with the state, which at the time was Governor Casey. And um, I include this because it's an early cartoon, and it is uh, still the relationship between the city of Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania. 
um, our kids, we keep trying to get more support for our kids, whether it's schools or health or housing. And um, the state is um, got little holes for us to put them in, uh, not, not uh, actual support. Um, and this, this is two part, uh, this is just a more modern version of the same thing. If Pennsylvania school funding is fair, then you wouldn't mind trading places. Whoops, and how do I go backwards? Sorry. Any rate, um, the, the uh, well, previous, ah, there I go. So I have done versions of this cartoon for 35 years and uh, clearly have not succeeded because um, we still have huge inequities in funding, not just between uh, rich districts in Philadelphia, but rich, dis or rich districts in other poor cities like Reading and, um, uh, and Pittsburgh and others. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still get um, a lot of mail just saying, well, th there's, it, there's no use spending money on Philadelphia kids. They aren't ever going to learn. And it just still frosts me to this day that there's um, that kind of inequity in, in, our, uh, in our state. Um, this is another Pennsylvania legislature cartoon, which I drew after the state legislature took time out of its busy schedule to declare the mushroom as the state vegetable. Um, and it was going briskly through the process until someone pointed out that a mushroom isn't a vegetable. It is a fungus. So I did this cartoon of um, our state uh, representatives. And in return, I got a, a beautiful letter from the, um, the head of the house at the time, Bob O'Donnell from Philadelphia, who uh, made a big proclamation naming me as the Pennsylvania State Vegetable Substitute. That is uh, one of my prize prizes. I, I cherish that. Um, then then uh, in the next election, the first mayoral election that I was um, uh, going to be cartooning about was 87 with um, Wilson Good was running for re-election. John Egan was testing the political waters and all of a sudden Frank Rizzo just announced that he was going to jump into the race. Um, I include this even though it's a terrible drawing and I, it makes me my eyes hurt. So I, I'm sure yours are pretty sore too. But Rizzo called up and asked for a copy of this cartoon or the cartoon, I, I can't remember which. Um, so he didn't live all that far away from us. So my husband and I one night put our kid in the stroller and strolled up his driveway in Chestnut Hill and knocked on the back door, the kitchen door and said, here's your cartoon. And he said, oh, come on in. And uh, he and Carmela were at the uh, kitchen table. We all sat down with the parrot was there uh, Franny Rizzo came through at one point and he just started uh, talking about, you know, uh, life and um, <laughs> he, he uh, kindly showed me his, um, his room where he had a, 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 a cartoon by the previous Daily News cartoonist and he said, I really like this one. I said, well, you know, you're suing him for uh, another cartoon he did about you. He goes, I am. <laughs> and the, the room itself was very interesting because it had a long wall and it had rifles lined up, you know, like in a big gun case in it. So I, it was, uh, uh, that was interesting. 
but he was, you could just understand why people gravitated towards him if he liked you. Um, and by the end of the, you know, we chatted for a little while and then he asked my husband what he did. Um, and um, he's a lawyer and uh, not, not that kind of lawyer, but at any rate, it, Rizzo started saying he could fix him up with somebody, one of his um, friends in law practice. And that's when I realized I could not get to know the politicians that I would be covering because um, there's, it's just too entangled. There's too, there's, there are too many uh, temptations, the impropriety of it, uh, of being independent. It's just, you know, you have to maintain that. So um, that was, the, the, this cartoon had sort of a, an interesting afterlife too. Um, but Frank Rizzo inspired this cartoon, which I did of Tony Auth when he left the newspaper. Uh, the pen in his cummerband band is a reference to the billy club that um, uh, Rizzo famously wore when he went out one night to uh, during um, uh, riots up in, in North Philly. Um, and it, for Rizzo, it was a symbol of that he was a tough cop and he would beat someone on the head if he needed to. And for Tony, of course, it was that he would draw them tough. And he was just such a wonderful uh, mentor and friend um, and, and died way too young. But uh, I, I enjoyed drawing this for the page that uh, when he left. And I really miss the Enquirer building. I can't believe the police are going to be in it. <laughs> oh, well. And this is, uh, speaking of Rizzo, the last one I did about him. Um, this was when, when we were, not this summer, but uh, a previous go round on what we were going to do with the Rizzo statue. At the time, there was uh, this wonderful um, uh, uh, sculpture uh, temporarily on the M in the MSB uh, lot. It was called All Power to the People by Hank Willis Thomas. It was this uh, Afro pick um, it's situated, you know, maybe 25 or 30 yards away from the Rizzo one. But I, I felt like um, this was a good way to combine the two. Uh, then speaking back with um, our mayors and Harrisburg, this is uh, Governor Rendell saying, we had to go through the state capitol to get here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is when he was obviously, he was governor, not mayor. But um, it just, it again illustrates the, di the difficulty Philadelphia has, even with a uh, 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 such a voluble and personable um, representative as, as uh, Governor Rendell, how difficult it is to get a fair shake for our kids. And we're still fighting for that. There's a school equity uh, bill now pending, and maybe that will um, uh, help equalize the funding for schools across the state. This one I included just because I love being able to draw politicians in tights. Uh, the, this is Governor Ed. We're so much classier since we got table games. Um, he, of course, was a huge fan of gambling. Early on, he wanted riverboat gambling uh, as mayor in the early 90s. Um, and it just, you know, it kills me that our state lives off of um, the lottery, booze, cigarette taxes, and um, gambling. But that, that's not changing anytime soon. Then on to John Street, 
um, mayor uh, in the 90s. And this is, uh, I did when he was running for mayor, what he's done for his district, he can do for the city. Um, I included this because uh, I went to talk up at Strawberry Mansion High School and showed the kids this cartoon and um, asked what they thought about it. And they, they were kind of upset, they were saying, you know, well, that's not fair. That's not a good way of showing our, our neighborhood. And, I, and then they thought about it a minute and they said, but you know, that's what it looks like. And then they started talking about it. And then they started talking about how they would like to see their area cleaner and, um, uh, you know, the, the houses fixed up and, uh, people supported. Um, it kind of broke my heart in a way, but I, I, I feel like um, uh, letting, you know, again, it's a, a cartoon is a way of getting into an issue under the skin that has an immediate reaction and then um, a, an ability to, to think about it a little bit and maybe um, uh, influence uh, thinking a little bit. Then on to Mayor Nutter. Um, I'm making City Hall sustainable. He's got the, the sustainable light bulb, but we also have um, all the problems in the city government and uh, the bureaucracy and the inefficiency that um, is the hallmark of Philadelphia. Although it is better now, but um, we still have um, the sheriff's office just, they, you know, Rebecca Reinhardt just found they couldn't, well, she discovered that the sheriff just didn't know where 200 um, uh, weapons were, were, that were supposed to be in their care. So uh, things are improving some, somewhat, but uh, we still have a ways to go to have a, a really well-run city. Um, back to the state legislature, and now we got Kenny. <laughs> this is uh, Mike Terzai in the seat. Um, if you take back your schools, who will teach them to smoke, drink, and gamble? Um, this was when um, Mayor Kenny uh, stopped the SRC and went to an appointed school board. Um, and uh, that was a big step and it, he managed to pull it off. The problem, of course, this year will be that um, we're back to a horrible budget deficit with because of the pandemic. And um, who knows what's going to happen to our school district. Um, at least uh, Terzai's out, but um, that's not the whole legislature. And this is the last one on the, uh, the mayors. This is back again to Wilson Good. And I think I could do this cartoon for every single mayor that um, who, who has been in office since I've been here. And, and that is the, it, while our, you know, while we do have more businesses now than we did when I got here, I mean, the city is obviously in much, much, much better shape. But if you go out into the suburbs and at, at all, um, and just like drive 422 out, out from King of Prussia, it is lined with campuses of um, businesses that employ thousands and thousands of people who, some of whom drive all the way out from um, Philadelphia, uh, uh, many thousands of our, our Philadelphia residents work in the suburbs. It would be great if those jobs were in the city. So um, uh, I, I always, when I hear the um, city council talking about taxing businesses more, um, I 
think of this cartoon, I think of 422, I think of uh, Malvern and the, the, the uh, many businesses that are moving in there and thinking that we should some way or another make it more attractive to have those, those businesses in Philadelphia. Last year, this time, I gave a talk at uh, Great Valley Middle School. Uh, school, that school, I think, has like 600 kids. And one of the teachers said they were expecting 300 more children in the next um, three or four years. That's how fast that area is growing. And um, that's where the jobs are. Um, this is a slight switch. This is um, to uh, federal government now. That, that's um, uh, the late Arlen Specter here with the uh, hand in the pack money. Um, and I included it because um, I, I, when we talk about women and what difference they make, I, uh, I think women can run all sorts of businesses, obviously. But um, the, the women I've seen in government uh, tend to be the ones caring about children and health and schools um, and, and women's issues of equality, obviously. So here are um, the, the men caring about the, the missiles, the guns, the uh, finances, and the women hoping to help the kids. Um, the woman um, in the foreground is Lynn Yackel, who was running in 92 for um, the US Senate. She lost um, to Arlen Specter, who's the guy on the left. But there were other women who were running as well. And um, as a matter of fact, they called it the year of the woman because there were six whole women in the US Senate. Um, at the end of that election. But um, I, uh, the, the Senate race between Yackel and Specter turned really ugly at one point uh, because there were rumors circulated that um, uh, Lynn Yackel was, uh, uh, her Presbyterian church on the main line had had a Palestinian and so therefore they uh, as speaker in one of their speakers series on the Middle East and therefore she was anti-Semitic. Um, it was an ugly rumor but it uh, it really gained traction. So we had a whole bunch of letters to the editor on this subject and I just did a little drawing to illustrate them which got me into a ton of hot water. And this was it. This appeared, it was maybe an inch and a half by an inch and a half. I mean, it was tiny, no caption. But um, the wrath came down on my head for having used the Star of David uh, in, a, in a cartoon. Um, and uh, uh, the paper was deluged by, with uh, angry letters. Uh, here's just a snippet of them. This was a full page in the paper. As this is just a, a little bit of a cut on it. Someone called me um, feminism's own, um, uh, oh, feminism's own Nazi, essentially, um, and and worse. And um, people, someone from the Spectre camp came in and to talk to the editor about what they, what ought to be done with me. Um, and I felt like, um, you know, I stood up for being able to use a symbol to, sh to show that it was um, a, it, it had to do with uh, anti-Semitism and uh, represent, represent uh, uh, certainly Israel, but um, the Jewish community. At any rate, um, that did not fly. It was, uh, it was said that I, I should never use that symbol in, in a cartoon. 
unfortunately, just two months earlier, I had done this cartoon for this as an illustration, again, for the letters page, again, uncaptioned. There was no controversy, no one, no one complained at all, because in this one, obviously, um, it's, it's used in, to make a different point. But I raise this and I include this here because symbols are still really, really fought over, obviously. Um, the most recent ones, of course, were the images of Muhammad, uh, but others, um, the cross in a cartoon is, if it's used critically, is always uh, controversial. Um, and, um, <laughs> This one also got me into hot water. It's Radical Islam sponsors the Miss Muslim World Con uh, Contest, Miss Illiteracy, Miss Can't Vote, Miss Waiting to be Stoned, which I did at a time when there was a Miss, uh, the, a Miss World Contest in um, Eastern Africa, which was uh, protested by um, Muslims in Africa as being uh, you know, anti-Islamic because it, of the, the, you know, the bathing suits and the beauty contest part. But it was also at the same time that um, Saudi Arabia was stoning uh, a woman to death uh, for, um, uh, for some misdeed. I don't know what it was, but um, I, uh, it, again, we had big protests, um, uh, representatives from the local Islamic community came in to talk to would talk with us. And um, there were protests outside the building at one point. Um, but what happened was that it opened up a, um, a big dialogue about, um, about Islam's place in America versus, you know, abroad. And um, it was the beginning, not this cartoon in particular, but part of um, a, an awakening in Philadelphia of a, a cross religious coalitions to learn about each other and, and um, find out uh, and cooperate uh, where possible with each other. So I, I view cartoons like this as way as uh, starting conversations rather than stopping them. And um, at any rate, I think that's what happened with this one too. It's also, uh, it's one cartoon. It's not the only way. <laughs> I, I don't like I don't like women being stoned to death. I'll just admit that right up front. But I in no way think that all that the entire uh, Islamic faith thinks that's okay either. So there are other uh, and there are other <laughs> there are other things uh, about it. Uh, um, the imagery. Um, I'm sorry, I got a little off here. But this is this one goes back to um, the Mohammed cartoons um, when we weren't allowed to, you know, when uh, no American papers would reprint the cartoon, the Danish cartoons in 2005 about um, uh, radical Islam. At any rate. Um, I wanted to do immediately a cartoon defending the cartoonists. Um, and my editor at the Daily News said, you know, that's not our fight. Uh, Daily News was really a city newspaper and it was not, you know, not a big international, didn't have big uh, foreign correspondence. Um, and so I stewed on it on it for a couple of days. And then I did this one um, with a Buddha and a Jesus and a rabbi and a Muhammad and uh, uh, just other wise people from other religions. Um, and they're all laughing together at the big fat book of offensive religious cartoons. So there's Muhammad in there, but he's laughing and happy. And 
um, I think it's the same as the use of the um, of the uh, Star of David. If it's if if it's used in a supportive and happy way, it's okay to use it. Uh, otherwise, it's verboten. Um, if, and just to make sure that you know that I've offended every religion, <laughs> this one was uh, one from 1991. Again, this is about the PA state legislature because um, they were at, uh, the, the Catholic bishops were saying, yes, I am for choice in education. I am for the state giving your tax money to parents to give to me so I can teach their kids to be against choice in abortion. Um, and again, uh, much consternation. Um, we heard from the lo local archdiocese. And uh, my line on this is that I, you know, I am not going to <laughs> comment on anyone's beliefs within their religion and, uh, and their own practices. But when, the, when a religious body comes to the state and asks for my ta tax dollars, in this case, um, for uh, religious schools, and I don't care if they're Catholic or any other school, um, I, um, I, I, it becomes a political issue, not a religious issue. And, and therefore, it has to withstand the scrutiny of cartoonists as well as legislators. Um, and this is what happens if you let every single religion um, cut what they think is objectionable. Remove anything that you find offensive. Snip, 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 snip. And that's what you get left as a newspaper. Um, you have, you know, I will say, you know, you can, that maybe I have made mistakes at, oh, from time to time, but it's a big pool of information and uh, opinion and uh, the reaction and react, uh, reactions is what makes the conversation. And you can have different opinions on different things. Uh, like I did the one on the uh, Miss Muslim World. Well, here's another way of looking at it. This is me and a daughter, uh, an unnamed daughter, uh, at the uh, King of Prussia Mall trying to get her some clothes one year. So this is the first, um, first panel. Mmm, this was the Britney Spears years. I, I, I just heard on that Britney Spears just turned 49 years old. Oh, well, I hope she can find blouses that meet, that cover her midriff now because she certainly didn't sport any um, back then. So I get this brilliant idea of what I can dress my daughter in. So, modesty. And the way that uh, we can all finally uh, protect our churches and synagogues and uh, mosques is uh, linking arms together. I see that we are um, uh, at 827, so I I think I will just um, stop the cart stop the um, the show here. I'll just. Oh, well, here's race. We got to do race. I'm unarmed. I'll give you anything. Just name it. Directions. This is way back. This was in uh, 1990. Let me consult our mandatory sentencing guidelines. Uh, white set free probation, eight, and a, eight to 12 months, eight to 12 years. Um, doesn't need an explanation. And um, this one I, uh, I, I will just, I included because, um, I, well, I'll tell you why. Here it is, the first part. Well, what are you wearing that for, son? So the cops don't hassle me. 
And I, when I drew it, I did not know that it was um, uh, a day where the uh, wife of a police officer who had just been shot, um, or who had been shot, it was a big hearing uh, for, for her and the family. And um, it was a black police officer who had been shot. And, you know, on another day, this would have been fine. And I sent it out nationally in my syndication, but I pulled it from our paper. Um, it's just like timing is everything. And people aren't ready to look at hard stuff if they're, if, if they're feeling, you know, if, they're, if there's something going on in their lives that deep and personal. And it's not just their lives, it's the city's life as well. So um, uh, again, I sent it out national and I got complaints from a, a police uh, organization in Northern New Jersey um, saying that it was unfair to police. But um, it's uh, not an uncommon, um, it's not an uncommon sentiment. Any rate, um, there's, there were more, but I've run out of time and I want to hear your questions. Um, so a lot of questions on uh, whether or not you have a higher authority to respond to with regard to your cartooning and the topics that you approach. You mean like at editors? Exactly. Yeah, well, Sandy, how much of an influence? Um, well, they, it, you know, uh, at this point, I am pretty clear what I want to do. And uh, uh, we occasionally have uh, conversations about the, the, the um, cartoons, but it's often things on like on timing for it. For example, that, that last one I showed, that would be an issue on timing. Um, one on uh, just today, I, I, I prepared today, I didn't do a cartoon today, pardon me, but um, I had suggested an, an idea about one of our state legislators who, uh, Republicans who has contracted COVID and I said, well, I wouldn't want to do it right away. I want to make sure he, you know, he wasn't seriously ill. Um, but um, uh, Sandy said, you know, you know, you just can't tell how long it would take to, for COVID and you just don't want to have something about somebody who's sick with a terrible disease, whether you didn't like the way it was handled or, or, or not. So there are things like that, that an editor can actually be very helpful on. Um, so don't tell Sandy, I said that. Thumbs the word. So okay. somebody asked, do you, um, do you ever have to draw a cartoon that matches something that is editorial is working on in some way? No, I don't. But one, one thing I w would like to say about the previous, um, question. Um, I, I, I told I told you about that that one uh, cartoon where uh, my editor at the time, uh, Michael Days, did, just said, you know, the Daily News isn't isn't the it, our issue is not the Danish cartoons, we'll just stay out of that one. Um, and that was as close as I ever came to having you know, the brakes put on. And I felt like I really worked around it. The cartoon that I did do has gone around the world many times whenever this controversy comes up. Um, but uh, the only time one did not appear in the paper was in the Inquirer when I did one on uh, the guy who owned the building where the wall fell on the Salvation Army. And, um, it was critical, very critical of him. And that did not run in the Inquirer, but it ran in the Daily News, which is why we need two newspapers in town. <laughs> and you should subscribe to all of them. <laughs> here, here. Has your audience, expand, audience expanded to other areas of the country now that the Daily News is available digitized? And follow up, does your Quaker background influence your work? 
Uh, well, the first one's easy to answer. Yes. Um, I get hate mail from all over the country. <laughs> it's great. Uh, but also people, I mean, as you, everyone knows, mostly people follow people they want to follow because they like the work. Um, so that's been great. I mean, it's like opens, it opens up our world and um, um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, what was the other part that you how does your quakerism affect oh your cartoon? uh well i'm kind of a bad cartoonist i'm a bad quaker so <laughs> it goes hand in hand but um it's i i actually it is kind of a conflict because uh, quakers are very conflict diverse generally speaking i mean they like to make trouble but uh uh would pro uh, pr prefer the peaceful path and cartoons don't, you know, don't operate that way. They they poke and they state they're unequivocal, and they don't they don't get into discussion groups. <laughs> so um, they operate on a different way. But as I said, I really feel like they um, can be used by all sorts of people and um, to amplify all sorts of issues. Um, so for example, I, I didn't even begin to show the cartoons I've done on gun violence. Um, that could be another entire evening and discussion. Uh, gun violence, privacy, um, abortion rights, women's rights, all of those things um, have, uh, they're, they're issues I care deeply about. And I think that they, they, they get conversations started. Do you think cartoons can change the world? No, <laughs> I don't. I mean, if you look at the cartoons that the reason I did the cartoons about the, 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 the city and the state is that this is 35 years of that relationship too. And it still stinks. I mean, and it's going to be bad this year, too, because, um, you know, the Dems, if you look at the maps, I think only, was it 12 counties out of the entire state voted Democratic, and the rest were all red, uh, red, uh, red counties. Um, you know, it's a, it's a stark contrast. We don't know each other in this state. We don't co-mingle forces. Um, so yeah, I think that I don't think a cartoon is ever going to change that. But I wish that a cartoon would would get our our um, our politicians in in Philadelphia to get out into the state and make more alliances with the rest of the state. Um, and and try to break down some of the that that uh, ideological um, those barriers i'm going to keep going there are so many questions here um maybe we can do lightning round or something like that someone asks if you have a favorite politician to draw well uh donald trump's right up there in the pantheon of great people to draw <laughs> Uh, I, I got tired of drawing him, but you know, uh, he was pretty easy. Uh, I liked Obama. Um, you know, what is hard is, um, pale old white men and guess who we're having for a president. Oh, it's going to be hell for the cartoonists. <laughs> They're everybody's still working on their caricatures. But you know, there. Uh, I always joked that um, people made a big deal out of lips. You know that um, you know if you drew somebody with two big lips, that would, uh, especially if they were black, you would say, "Oh, that's an insult." Well, this just in: white people don't have lips, <laughs> and so to draw like George W. Bush, the original one. There were no lips there. It, that's what his problem was with that promise. Read my lips, no new taxes. He didn't have lips to read. <laughs> so it just, it was terrible. Oh God, 
what a nightmare having those Bushmen to have to draw. Well, I'm glad that's over. Um, <laughs> on to the next. Um, lots of questions about the mechanics of drawing. Um, how do you do it? Is there underdrawing? Are, do you oh. go through many versions? That sort oh. of thing. Oh, thank you for asking that question. I have my little, this is how I get started in the morning. I read, I get four newspapers a, a day, plus the, the, uh, the Philadelphia Tribune twice a week. And the reason I get newspapers is one online, I don't read well. I don't, I just don't read as carefully as I should. And um, a nice big broadsheet like this, the other thing it has is big advertising space. So while you're reading and you get an idea because there's some great writing and it's something pops into your head, you can make, you can make a drawing. And there you can see the first draft of a cartoon that then went through can you see many? Well, well, you can kind of sort of. Yeah, many, many, many. That's Biden, by the way, the old, you know, the, the old white guy. And there's the final drawing. But this, of course, isn't exactly what you see in the newspaper, because then I shaded in black and white for the, the uh, inquirer. And then I color it for online and the daily news and for my syndicate. So there, there you go. That's the process. And I just, oh, I have this new pen I really love. It's, it was expensive and it's hard to fill, but I really like it. So that's my new pen. I used to be using rapidographs if there are any pen nerds out there. Who makes the new one for the pen nerds? It's a pilot, but it's expensive. It's like over a hundred dollars for this little pen. People who are serious only. Um, someone asked if you start with a caption or do you start with a drawing? Well, okay, this one was, uh, this was actually the first time I drew this cartoon. Um, let me see here, you can, s the first time, my first sketch of it was like Bob, Ted, and Alice, you know, if they were all in the same bed together. And Biden was saying to him, um, you know, Donald. Um, but um, I didn't think that worked as well um, visually because uh, it wasn't quite clear why they were all in the same bed together first. So this is clear that he's coming to get into the presidential bed. So, it, it, you know, what I what I have to say about reading is that I think good writing is just inspirational because good writing is vivid writing. And vivid writing is, you know, a cartoon is just good writing made vivid or more vivid. Um, so I, um, I have to thank all the the um, writers who have over the years inspired or triggered my cartoons. Someone asked, looking back at your tremendous career, what are two or three key lessons that you learned that you would share with others? And following on advice to uh, a cartoonist, a young cartoonist who wanted to get into the field. Well, I would like to know, I mean, if anyone out there who's listening knows younger cartoonists, let me know. We're we're looking for um, new cartoonists, um, younger ones. I'm old, and I should not be cartooning anymore. It's a young person sport. They, you know, you're going to come up with the uh, the new images. There, you're going to be quoting. You know, you're not going to be quoting. Look for the union label. <laughs> That's forty years old. So they will be quoting what is current now and they will be seeing things from current eyes and um so yeah i i i i think there it's really difficult the kind of cartooning i do is probably pretty difficult to replicate because i actually got a salary for doing this for all these years uh, although 
I'm not on contract now. I don't, I'm not on salary. Um, but um, the younger cartoonists aren't going to have that because newspapers aren't, um, aren't, you know, they're, they've got other priorities. Uh, cartooning will be down the list. But, um, and also the cartoons that I've shown you and that you've seen, they were all drawn to appear on newsprint and now they are being transmitted into uh, the virtual world. So uh, actually things like memes online have become the new cartoons. And I think uh, what's gonna happen is probably uh, younger cartoonists are gonna incorporate animation or some kind of sound to um, uh, make them uh, digital first and then the image. But um, I, I have to say that I, I still really, really value good drawing in a cartoon. And you can get better, as you saw from my my pathetic start. But um, there's some really wonderful uh, uh, artists who are cartooning now, and I hope the young young people will come up. And I hope that they are from um, a variety of backgrounds. Most of the cartoonists are white guys um, uh, of the old newspaper cartoonists. There are very few of us women. Um, there's a handful of um, young black uh, and like uh, Lala out in Sanford or uh, LA is a fantastic um, Latino uh, cartoonist. So you know, new people are do taking it up, but um, more, more the merrier. Is there? Um any particular cartoonist who has inspired you or affected your career in any way or influenced your drawing? Uh, well, Tony was a big influence. Uh, he's the person I saw most in the, you know, after I got out of college and came back here. But um, I, I love Ed Sorrell's work. Um, he, Jules Pfeiffer and uh, Arnie Roth, Arnie grew up in North Philly, um, <laughs> they were all born within three months of each other and they're all 92 years old and they're all still drawing. It's really astounding. Um, but Sorrell's line work, I just, I find um, it just sings to my heart. I love it. And I, there are other cartoonists I like too. I think Matt Davies has a beautiful style. Ann Telness uh, at the Washington Post is a graphic genius, a caricature genius. She's just unbelievable. You should really look up her work. Um, you know, Jeff Danziger's, there just, there's just a whole ton of, of people who are, who are really quite fine cartoonists. So. Thank you. Somebody, uh, this occurred a number of times. How has your engagement with your readers changed over your career? Well, for starters, they don't write letters anymore. Nobody writes a letter that comes through the mail and lands in a mailbox. And by the way, if somebody here has written a letter, <laughs> nobody's going into our office. <laughs> there may be a letter or two in my mailbox, but I wouldn't know it. Um, so people get in touch. My email is right under my cartoons. So I hear from people and I hear from very vividly. They write as vividly as I urge people to draw. <laughs> Somebody asks, what's on your nightstand? And if your work has been collected into a book, um, I know you have herstory and that you're working on something with Jonathan Zimmerman as well. Yeah. Well, I do just happen to have my little <laughs> book I pulled this together because this as most of you know it's the ninth or it's the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment so I just put together 19 plus quite a few more cartoons um, about women's issues um, and that's available at signetunes.com and uh, so uh, uh, great little holiday gifts but um, I, I did one uh, many years ago on pri uh, privacy and um, uh, 
I, I think what I'd like to do, and if anyone out there uh, wants to help, um, let me know. I'd like to put together like small volumes like this. P cartoons don't age well, especially, you know, and a lot of these cartoons, if I wasn't here to explain them, you wouldn't exactly know what was what. But the gun cartoons, uh, cartoons on racial equality, cartoons on women's issues, cartoons on privacy, I would like to do like little collections and be able to go to groups like this and talk to them about their issues, whether it's guns or uh, women's rights or whatever. So um, if anybody wants to help on that, um, please feel free because I'm going to be a freer human being come January 1st. <laughs> We've got a couple of notes from people who would like to see this run longer and again. So they'll be able to watch it online, but people should know that if they have a group that they could invite you, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I would love, I, I love talking to groups and I love talking in person because it's just better. I can't see all of you and I would love to see the appalled looks on your faces. <laughs> so, um, uh, in, yes, in, do, do invite me, and uh, if any, I, I, would, I would love to do it. This might be a negative one to end on. I probably should have ended it a moment ago, but somebody says, hi, Signe. Did you feel like you made it when you got fan mail or hate mail for a special cartoon? That's not negative. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I just wanted to set it up in case. No, no, no. It's not negative at all. It's, uh, uh, I mean, there are, there are very negative um, uh, comments. My favorite um, recent one was, uh, I did one that it was about, it, it had, um, it had a coat hanger in it and it was about you'll be surprised to know abortion and someone wrote me the letter said no greeting just i wish your mother used a coat hanger on you <laughs> so you know sometimes in the morning you have to have your coffee really early before you open your email sounds like a good idea well there's a tremendous amount of praise coming in through the q a um so Signe, thank you so much for your career, your bravery, your talent, and everything you've uh, done for Philadelphia with your work. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your, your being with, his, with us.